This video is going to be an introduction to circles and their many properties. The first few slides I'm going to go over here are some basic terms involving circles. So these are, are not on your note sheet, but if you would like to write them down on a separate sheet of paper, please do so. A circle by definition is the set of all points in a plane that are equidistant from a given point called the center of the circle. So in the construction of a circle, you create your center point, we'll call it P here, and the circle will be created as a point that is equidistant, or that is points that are equidistant from that center. And so if I drew a bunch of these dots, all of those are equidistant from that center P. We can connect those, and that's what creates my circle P, which is what we will label it. A circle is labeled by its center point. A couple of special terms involve um, with a circle. A segment whose endpoints are the center and any point in the circle is called its radius. So this example right here is one of the, one of the radii I could draw. I could draw an infinite number of them would it, which would expand, extend from the center to the edge of the circle. Another segment inside of a circle is called a chord, and this is simply just a segment whose endpoints are on the circle. So right here, this example would be a chord, this example would be a chord, and so on and so forth. There is one special type of chord, however, and if you look down here in this bottom drawing, a chord that contains the center of the circle we call its diameter. The length of the diameter, as you may remember, is twice the length of the radius. A couple other vocabulary terms, a secant line and a tangent line. These are lines, not segments, like the first slide. A secant is a line that intersects a circle in two different points. So essentially, one way of thinking about it is a chord is a segment with its endpoints touching the circle, so it intersects the circle twice. And a secant line is that exactly, a line which intersects the circle twice. A tangent line, on the other hand, only intersects the circle one time. And that special point that it crosses is called the point of tangency. This particular line here is considered tangent to the circle. Here are some examples using the different terms we've already described. Take a moment and pause this video to try them yourself and then press play when ready. AC is a segment, so that tells me that and the C lies on the center of the circle, A lies on the circle, tells me that AC is a radius. AB, on the other hand, is also a segment, however, its endpoints are both on the circle, which means I would say it's a chord. However, since it goes through the center of the circle C, we're actually going to call this a diameter. As for DE, DE is a ray, and that ray, DE, crosses point B. Point B is on the circle. A line or ray that which crosses the circle one time, or intersects the circle one time, we call a tangent line. And finally, line AE is a line which intersects the circle twice. We would call this a secant line. At this point, we're going to move on to our note sheet. So if you could turn to the side that says tangent, take a moment, pause this video to write down the definition and theorems related to tangent lines. Plus, pl press play when ready for an explanation of these. We've already discussed the definition of a tangent. However, three theorems can be concluded from tangent lines. Number one, if a line is tangent to a circle, then it is perpendicular to the radius drawn at the point of tangency. What does that look like? Well, if I draw a circle with a tangent line that touches it at this point, we'll call that point P, okay? I know that if I draw my center of my circle O, OP is going to create a radius. The radius OP and the tangent line here, which contains P, will be perpendicular to each other. The second theorem is just the converse of what we just said. So if you know a line is perpendicular to a radius, that line is considered a tangent line. And finally, if two segments from the same exterior point are tangent to the circle, then they are congruent. So if I have two tangent lines drawn here as such, that's really a tangent line, 
Sorry for the poor drawing there. So now that we have that here, this segment right here, so here's my point of tangency P, here's my other point of tangency, we'll call it Q, and they intersect at this point R. The length of QR and the length of PR are going to be congruent according to this last theorem. Let's look at a couple examples of how we can verify whether a line is tangent or not. So in this first example, let's write the sides here as 11. Let's make this side 60, actually. And this entire length, 61. So we're looking at a triangle. And according to our first theorem, a line is tangent to a circle if it is perpendicular to its radius. So in this example, I am testing to see if this is a right angle. Since this is a triangle, we can use the converse of the Pythagorean theorem to prove if this is a right angle or not. So I take my two legs, 11 squared and 60 squared, and we don't know if it's equal, so I'll put a little question mark above it, is possibly equal to 61 squared. Well, 11 squared and 60 squared, when I evaluate that, I get 3721. When I evaluate 61 squared, I also get 3721. So I have proved equality here. So yes, this is a right triangle, which means, in conclusion, yes, this line is tangent. Now let me look at a different example here that has some givens a little differently presented to you here. So although I didn't give you all the side lengths of this triangle on the right, I still have enough information to use the converse of the Pythagorean theorem because the distance from the center of the circle to the end point is on the circle. That is considered the radius. I've given you the radius length is 3 here, so this length right here is technically 3, which would make the entire length of this 8, which would be my hypotenuse or possible hypotenuse using the converse of the Pythagorean theorem. So I take 3 squared plus 7 squared equals 8 squared. Again, we don't know if it's equal, so we'll throw a little question mark there. 3 squared and 7 squared, that would be a 58. 8 squared gives me 64, and thus I have a problem. This triangle technically is an obtuse triangle, which means it is not the length, the side length of 7 is not a tangent line. So no, it is not tangent here. Now let's take a look at some examples in reverse, where I've given you that the line is tangent, and we can use what we know about the tangent theorems here. So in my first example on the left, I'm given that this length of 16 is tangent to the circle, which means if I want to find the length of my radius, I can use the Pythagorean theorem to solve for r. So leg squared, so r squared, plus the other leg squared, which is 16 squared, equals 8 plus r squared. Now be careful with this. It's 8 plus r quantity squared. We'll get to, we'll get to this part in a minute. On this side, I have r squared. 16 squared is 256. Now, as for dealing with this right side, the answer to this is not 64 plus r squared. Be, when you have additive terms inside of parentheses, you cannot distribute the squared term. What you need to do instead is FOIL this. So essentially, you're going to take 8 plus r and multiply by 8 plus r and run your operations here for FOIL. When you do that, I end up getting 64 plus 16r plus r squared. The good news is with this problem now that I have this set up is that there's an r squared on either side of my equation which means they will cross out. So I'm only left with 256 equals 64 plus 16r. All I would need to do from here is subtract my 64, divide by 16, and I end up with an r value here measuring 12 units. Try the example on the right here. Press pause, try it, and then press play ready when you're ready for a solution. In this case, I have 12 squared plus r squared equals r plus 6 squared. Again, be very careful with how you work this. This ends up being 144 plus r squared equals r squared 
plus 12R plus 36. Again, I obtained that through foiling. The R squareds will cancel each other out, so I'm left with 144 equals 12R plus 36. Solving this equation, I'm going to get an R value of 9. In the last property here, I have 50 plus x and 2x plus 15 as my side lengths. I'm sorry, 2s, 2x minus 15. And according to our third theorem with tangents, tangent lines that intersect will have the co a common distance. Therefore, 2x minus 15 will be equal to 50 plus x. Upon solving this, subtract x, add 15 over, divide by nothing because it's going to be a 1 x is going to equal 65. At this time, turn your paper over and we will take a look at some properties of chords. Take a moment to jot these down. Again, press pause if you need to as I'm going to go through and explain each of these quickly. So the first two are essentially converses of each other. So in the first two here, it basically is saying that if the chords are congruent, then their arcs are also going to be congruent. So in this case, two chords of a circle are congruent if their intercepted arcs, what I'm coloring here in pink, are the same. The second theorem is there's a reverse of that. So if the arcs are congruent, then we know the chords must be congruent. The third theorem talks about a perpendicular bisector of a chord, and it will always contain the center of the circle, and it will bisect the arc. So perpendicular bisector here, again, we'll cut this in half make this a right angle, and it will go through the center of the circle. And lastly, these arcs are going to be congruent to each other. Finally, two chords will be congruent if they are the same distance from each other. And so as I look at this here, if I draw two chords in, they're going to be the same if their distance to the center of the circle, which again, shortest distance to the center would be a perpendicular line, if these lengths were congruent to each other. We're going to look at a few examples of how we can use these in problems. If I look at my first example, if I were to give you the intercepted arc of my top chord here is 108, and the bottom one is 108, and this length is 7, we know right away that the length of this chord right here would have to be 7 according to my first theorem. On the flip side, if I know both chords are 9, and I know this arc measure is 83 degrees. I know this arc measure up top must also be 83 degrees. In the third example, this radius here represents the perpendicular bisector of this chord. So if this top chord measures 11, this bottom chord measures 2x minus 1, I can simply just set these equal to each other, solve this equation, and get a value of 6 as my answer. In our third example, here I have a chord of 8 and a chord of an unknown length. However, their distance to the center of the circle are both 4. Now the 4 is not important, it's the fact that they're the same. And since they are the same, this chord length over here must be 8. And finally, if I were to give you that the entire length of a chord is 18, as I've done right here, and I want you to find the length of each side of this chord as formed through this radius. Again, the radius is a perpendicular bisector of the chord, according to my uh, third theorem. So x here would be 9, and y here would also be 9. Please feel free to rewind this video, replay any of the topics that we've talked about, and bring these notes completed into class tomorrow, where we'll spend more time practicing these different skills and theorems.